Well, social media was a forum for anyone who wanted to express their opinions about Gian Gomeshi himself or the trial or the outcome. So we're asking today, does the digital age threaten an independent judicial system? How does it affect it, if at all? Anthony Moustakalis is the president of the Criminal Lawyers Association. He's joined me in studio. There's a lot of ground I want to cover with you here, so sure. we'll piece it out a little bit. You heard Marie Hannon just referring to uh, that hashtag. Um, and, and she said as well in the interview that she's sort of signed off social media. She doesn't want to follow this, doesn't want to be affected by it anymore. And, and she got a lot of criticism for having defended him at all. Um, how do lawyers handle that very new kind of pressure that many may not have experienced prior to the social media age? Well, I think in a number of ways. I mean, one of the things is a lot of lawyers have their own uh, media presence, Twitter presence, uh, uh, websites, Facebook, and so on. And uh, another thing that lawyers do is uh, scour social media to find uh, information that's helpful. For example, lawyers now, especially defense lawyers, will look to Facebook profiles of potential jurors to get some idea of whether they're fair or whether they've expressed a bias. I mean, you'd be so surprised what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you feel that, that lawyers are prepared for the kind of pressure they might get in a case like this? And as a high-profile lawyer, you may have read your name in the paper 15, 20 years ago or, or seen your, your name on the headline of the newscast of the day, but now it's, it's instant. People are tweeting, live blogging right from the courtroom. Well, I think lawyers are ready for that, and we have been. I mean, our job is basically to protect our clients and uh, to do our work in court, and uh, that's what happened in the Gomeshi case. I mean, uh, Ms. Hennon, as well as the uh, Crown, uh, didn't comment uh, while the case was going on. They made their uh, statements uh, afterwards and provided information, and uh, I think the system worked well. Is it helping our understanding of the justice system or corrupting it? Are people responding to what they hear without really understanding what took place in a courtroom or is it drawing people in? Well, my own view is, is that the, uh, the court system should be more open to, uh, to media generally. I mean, I, when I started years ago uh, in the uh, mid-80s, there was an experiment done where they had a uh, camera in, uh, in a jury trial. And the camera was at the back. It didn't zoom in to uh, terrify the witness or anyone else. And, uh, and it worked well. And I think that would give people a better understanding of uh, what happens in the courtroom as opposed to the restrictions that the media forced to face by uh, tweeting. Uh, tweeting and, uh, and writing later about what took place, drawing cartoons, for instance, and so forth. I mean, listen, it, it probably goes without saying that I'm a fan of the idea of cameras in the courtroom because I think you give uh, true transparency. Um, but the argument the other way, and I've heard some other judges say this, is that uh, if you do that, that you're going to have lawyers grandstanding, witnesses grandstanding, that it will kind of corrupt the actual jurisprudence. I mean, I think Marshall McLuhan said TV's a cool medium and eventually everyone is going to, uh, to adapt it. I mean, you won't notice that it's in there. And that's what happened in the experiment that I uh, got to observe years ago when I, was, uh, when I was starting out. Again, if it's done in a way that's respectful and not to intimidate, I mean, not cameras, you know, in people's faces in the courtroom and so right. on, uh, it, in my view, it would be very positive and it would uh, enhance the uh, appearance of justice in the minds of the public. We've talked about, you know, the, the pressure that might be felt by lawyers taking part in a high-profile case, but even yesterday, um, the judge who was delivering her ruling in the case of Marco Musso, uh, who had killed four people in a drunk driving um, yes. case, started by saying, listen, I received some emails, and, and she was alerting both the Crown and Defense, saying here's a copy of that email. We didn't see it, but it seemed clear that someone was trying to put pressure on her to give him a longer sentence. And she said, you know, these emails were inappropriate. They're not going to influence my decision. But I'm wondering, how do judges handle this rather unique new intrusion on them? Well, much in the same way that they always have. I mean, that's why they're independent. I mean, they're not uh, subject to political pressure or, or anything else. And, and they're trained and they continually get uh, um, updated uh, educational programs to assist them to manage that. But again, the basic principles are you have to be fair. You don't communicate uh, with the judge uh, outside of the courtroom. And when that happens, the judge brings it to the attention of the parties. The parties get a chance to respond if, there's, if there is an issue, which there certainly wasn't in that case. And I, I take your point that, you know, that that's the professional requirement of the job. But people are human, too. And it was interesting to see what Marie Hannon, in particular, has encountered um, as a lawyer in a very high-profile case. I can't recall a time I've seen that kind of pressure brought to bear on someone who is 
defending someone in a trial. This seems to me fairly unique, and I'm wondering if you think this is the new normal. Um, in some ways, it's, uh, it's unique, but in my view, it was a showcase trial. I mean, people were looking to see how the system was going to work. And, mm -hmm. for example, I think it showed how well the system uh, works uh, in Canada and in the Ontario Court of Justice. It should be noted that um, the accused had an option there, Mr. Gomeshi, of having a jury trial, which would have involved a preliminary hearing and so forth, but chose to do the case because had confidence in the uh, in the court system. And that's because those judges over the last so many years have been selected through a, a very fair, open uh, process that includes an interview. And so I think it uh, bodes well for the system. I'm curious, as you, as you leave here today, if people are commenting on social media about things that you said in this interview, does it affect you? Do you look at it? Do you go, okay? Well, I mean, you know, sure, I mean, I'm human too, but I mean, you develop a thick skin, right? And it's, it's like anything else. I mean, people are entitled to express their opinions. I express my opinion as well. And uh, I mean, that's the nature of our society today. Thanks for expressing your opinions here. Thank you very much. Anthony Moustakalis is the president of the Criminal Lawyers Association. He joined me in studio. We talked about that hashtag, I believe survivors. It was all over social media after Gian Gameshi was acquitted. Some fairly prominent people were using it, including federal NDP leader Tom Mulcair, who once ran a law practice. In her interview with Peter Mansbridge, Marie Hennon talked about that, said that Mulcair and other uh, politicians who would use that hashtag denigrated the justice system that he in particular once worked in to win votes. Well, today, Mulcair responded to that on Twitter. He wrote, I believe strongly in the presumption of innocence and the right to a strong defense, but I also believe survivors. And he included a link to the news story about Hannon on the CBC News website. So if you'd like to see that link or more of Peter's interview, you can go online, too, and find it there at cbcnews.ca. In fact, this weekend, Mansbridge one-on-one -on -one will have more of that conversation. It's Saturday night at 6.30 Eastern here on CBC News Network.